Hey everyone, it's Una just jumping in ahead of today's episode with some exciting news. Return to Regalia is now available on Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and other major podcast platforms. Up until now, I've only been publishing the podcast on YouTube, but now we are officially hosted. I'm still working on getting us available on Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts. Another great thing about being hosted is that we now have episode transcripts on the way. Huge shout out to Nate for being our transcriptionist and helping us make the podcast more accessible. If you want to help me pay for our new podcast hosting service, you can donate to the podcast on Ko-Fi at ko-fi.com slash return to regalia, or find the link in our pinned post on our Tumblr, return to regalia.tumblr.com. One more note before I go, this episode was recorded over Zoom because my guest was joining remotely. If the audio is a bit wonky in places, it's because Zoom does weird things to audio when people talk over each other. I tried my best to edit it, but I apologize if there are some unintelligible parts. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to Return to Regalia, an Underland Chronicles reread podcast. I'm Una. I'm Audie. Audie, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, you're our very first guest who is joining remotely, so that's really exciting. Awesome. Very excited. Yeah, today we're going to be covering chapters 15 and 16 of The Prophecy of Bane, in which Twitch Tip explains about ragers and the questers come across a mysterious island. But before we get into that, Audie, can you tell us a bit about how you got into the series? Yeah, so I was in third grade when I had found the books, and I actually uh, discovered the third book first, not realizing it was part of a series. So I read all of Curse of the Wormbloods, and then I went back to the start and read the series in the correct way. And I'm just as obsessed with it about 11 years later now. Yeah, and I also follow you on Tumblr, so I know that you actually have an Underland Chronicles tattoo. I do, yes. I got it for the 20th anniversary of the books, which was this past September. That's so awesome. Can you tell the listeners what it is? Oh, yeah. It says, fly you high on my arm. It's about the best leg I think I could get to commemorate it. That's so sick. I love that. Yeah, thank you. I also saw that you collect different editions of the books. I think that's so cool. I do. Yeah, I'm usually not one for collecting editions just because like financially, who has the money for that in this economy? But yeah, I mean, all of the the Underlight Chronicles are fairly cheap since they're like kids books and paperback. So Mm -hmm. I have like three variations plus a a British edition of the first book. That's awesome. How do you? Yeah. How do you find them? Do you just like look for them online? Yeah, most of them I've actually just gotten in store because I I look for them whenever I go to a bookstore. And uh, I think the most recent copies I got, I got for a Christmas gift because there's this one box set that comes with like an exclusive journal and you can only get the journal if you get the whole box set. So I did not get this again. Yeah, that's so cool. I love that. Yeah. So yeah, let's get into today's chapters. Where we left off, Gregor had just finished ranting to Luxa about how she should have helped save Twitch Tip from the Whirlpool. Chapter 15 starts with Gregor making a bed out of blankets on the floor of the boat. Ares comes over and says he's unsettled about Gregor rescuing Twitch Tip. At first, Gregor thinks Ares is going to give him the same talk Luxa did, but he actually just wants to make sure Gregor knows that he would have come to help him if he hadn't been holding the boat. Ares doesn't want Gregor to think he didn't come after him in the same way he didn't rescue Henry. Gregor assures Ares that he didn't expect him to drop the boat to come help him. Boots comes over and Gregor tells her, let's get some shut eye. She says, we shut eyes and lies down next to him. Gregor notes that he didn't put the life jacket back on her, and he worries about her safety. He asks Ares to promise that if something bad happens, he'll save Boots before he saves Gregor. At first, Ares tries to say he'll save them both, but when Gregor insists, he promises to save Boots first. And I was thinking this is just such a tough position that Gregor is putting Ares in. Yeah, 
I think this book does a lot to like solidify their connection as bonds. And like this scene is just such a good example of that. But also it's like, it's so tough because Gregor's kind of this outsider who's so new to like bonds in general. And I feel like this it's just such a horrid concept. You're so right. Like Gregor is asking Ares to put boots before himself, but that's not the point of a bond. Like the point of the bond is that you just put your bond above everyone else. And Gregor is like coming as an outsider into this culture and just kind of like messing with this tradition. Ares has already like messed up with his former bond and everyone hates him for that so it's a really tough position gregor asking aries to kind of like disobey the rules again to help boots yeah especially like with aries specifically like if gregor were to die because aries saved boot it doesn't matter that that's what gregor wanted i can't imagine that aries would be treated well for that Exactly. Like, even if Ares said, well, that's what Gregor asked me to do. Like, no one is going to give Ares a second chance after what happened with Henry. Right. Yeah. Feeling better, Gregor falls asleep and wakes hours later to find Twitch Tip lying up against him. He startles and she scoots away, looking embarrassed. Gregor realizes that she didn't roll into him by accident. She intentionally curled up next to him because she's so touch starved after living alone in the Deadland. He covers for her by apologizing for rolling into her in his sleep. I love this moment so much. I love it. This is really another one of those moments where it's like Gregor is so emotionally intelligent for an 11-year-old. Truly. Yeah. I just love that he immediately realizes her situation and is thinking about what she's had to go through and isn't going to be weird about it. He's just like trying to cover for her. Like, that's so nice. And he doesn't want her to feel left out anymore. Like, he's really making an effort to be nice to her. Yeah. Which is actually, now that I think about it, she's like kind of very similar to Aries in that way, where like they both sort of been cast out by their own communities. And I think it's really interesting that Gregor gets along with her so well. You're so right. Gregor loves helping an underdog. (laughs) Which tip says something about the boat not having enough room and then tells Gregor that she knows he made the others save her from the whirlpool. She says, Rip Red was right about you. He said, I couldn't judge you like I would other humans. I love that Rip Red is like complimenting Gregor behind his back. Yeah, he would never do that to his face. No, he does not want Gregor to know that he said this. I, Ripper and Gregor's sort of friendship, sort of allyship, sort of whatever they've got going on. It's just so interesting to me, like how it progresses through the books. Yeah, yeah. I think Gregor and Ripper already have this like really strong connection. Like Gregor totally thinks that Rip Red is this wise old rat who is a killing machine and like knows what's what in the underland and he completely well he doesn't trust him but he he knows that Rip Red knows what's best and I think that's part of why Gregor is being nice to Twitch Tip because Rip Red brought Twitch Tip for him yeah he really he really never trusts Rip Red even by the end of the series he still right I trust him but they still like have this mutual care for each other. They can't really admit it and they're kind of scared of what that means. <laughs> You're so right. Yeah, they never really become like friends, I would say. They're basically just like very strong allies throughout the series. Yeah. Gregor tells Twitch Tip that Vicus told him something similar about Rip Red on their first quest. Again, we love a Gregor Rip Red parallel. Yeah. They're especially with like the conversation that's about to happen with Gregor and Twitch Tip, like the ways that him and Rip Red are like so different, but also so similar, like regarding like the Rager thing and whatnot. It's so fascinating. I love their whole dynamic. Yeah, they're definitely one of the most interesting like relationships throughout the series. Gregor asks Twitch Tip how long she's been living on her own and why the other rats drove her out if she's such a talented scent seer. She says that three or four years ago, the rats realized she could smell their secrets and she can smell Gregor's too. Gregor's confused at first because he doesn't think he has any secrets, but then Twitch Tip tells him, I know what happens when you fight. Gregor tries to play it cool, but she goes on to say, 
You can't stop. You put out a scent. I have only smelled it once or twice before. We rats have a name for someone like you. You're a rager. And this is our very first mention of ragers. Yes. Even even a ray reading this scene, it like gives me chills because I always kind of forget about it a little bit. I'm like, what secret does Twitch Tit know about? And then I'm like, oh, shit. She does know one of his secrets. Yeah, it's such a intense moment because up until this point, we've been with Gregor. Like, what is happening when he fights? Why can't he remember when he fought the blood balls or the squid? We are also just like desperate to know what is going on with him. And we definitely feel his like desperation to find out. And then Twitch Tip just like comes in and explains it. But it's also like the worst thing because... Well, she says you're a rager and Gregor thinks rager sounds like someone who loses their temper a lot. And Twitch Tip goes on to explain that ragers have extraordinary fighting abilities and that a rager is a natural born killer. And immediately Gregor thinks it was absolutely the worst thing he could imagine anybody saying about him, which is so intense. Yeah. And it's it's just such like a core part of his character. And he doesn't like want to believe it at first. He, But he does kind of recognize, like, something's going on with him. And Twitch Tip is giving him the answer, but he doesn't want to admit that she's right. Twitch Tip tells him that no one knows except her and that it's not a comment about his morals. Being a rager is just something you're born as, the same as being a sensier. I have seen some people speculate that ragerhood actually comes from, like, a traumatic experience. YouTube user Oddity Autopsy commented on episode 15 that Rip Red's ragerhood might have been triggered by the flood of the Garden of the Hesperides. And I think that's a really interesting theory that I would like to keep coming back to as we go through the series. Yeah, that is so interesting because I was going to say, like, I'm really curious what the, like, overland equivalent of being a rager is because, like, Gregor's not from the Underland, so there's no reason why he should have picked up some underland specific trait unless it came from like an experience he had. I'm curious, like if when like Suzanne Collins writing the series, if she envisioned any specific parallel in the real world. Yeah, I always wondered that too. Like if Gregor had never gone to the underland, would he still be a rager? And would he just have to deal with that in the overland and like not know what that meant for him? Yeah, because didn't we... Doesn't he say that, like, he would defend the smaller kids at school who were getting picked on by bullies? So it's not like he wasn't getting into altercations, even if it was, like, every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, maybe he wouldn't have become a rager if he'd never picked up a sword. Yeah, it's so it's so fascinating to think about because the books make it seem like it's just something that's, like, part of him and that it's not negotiable it's not something that could be changed about him like twitch tip just says like it's something that you're bored with but i really like the the idea that it's related to a traumatic experience or or how you grow up somehow because i feel like that's the only way it really makes sense for gregor otherwise i find it hard to imagine it happening yeah i definitely want to keep thinking about that throughout the books especially as we hear more about being a rager from riff red yeah for sure Gregor thinks Twitch Tip can't be right because he doesn't like fighting or even arguing, but he admits that he couldn't control himself with the blood balls and the squid. Twitch Tip tells him to ask Rip Red about it, and Gregor thinks the main person he needs to talk to is a shrink, but then Twitch Tip reveals that Rip Red is a rager too. I mean, I agree that Gregor also should probably see a shrink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if Father Boy doesn't get there, me. Literally. Even just beyond the rager thing, he's got a lot going on. He has so much going on. Like, I don't know what he would tell a therapist in the Overland, but he needs to figure something out. Yeah, I was just having this conversation with Carrie on the last episode that someone should write a fan fiction that's, like, from the point of view of Gregor's therapist. Yeah, that'd be so crazy. Yeah, I just, I need to know, like, what would he even do? Like, he can't talk about the underland because that would be like that would cause a lot of problems (laughs) yeah he would get the wrong diagnosis yeah yeah i just i like this line too that he's like i need to talk to a shrink because he's definitely sensing that he's kind of losing it like he's afraid that he isn't in a good state of mind like he can't remember fully when he fights 
And that is like freaking him out. And I think this line kind of shows just how much he is uh, worried about his own mental state. It's really intense. Yeah. Especially when you think about it, like, I'm not sure if this is the connection that he would have made, but it, it does kind of run in his family. Like, obviously his grandma is a lot older, but like she has similar issues with memory and like making connections to things. And then like his dad's, you know, psychological issues also come from the other land. But if I were Gregor, I'd also probably be freaking out because it seemed like half of his family is having mental breakdowns of a sort. Yeah, you are so right. I had not considered that. Like, he is definitely surrounded by this as well. And yeah, I guess for him, it's not far-fetched that he is kind of, like, worried about his mental health because he's uh, seen it in his family. Yeah. So yeah, Twitch Tip reveals that Riffred is a rager. This makes sense to Gregor because Riffred really is a killing machine, and he remembers how Riffred tested his reflexes by trying to smack him with his tail. He's afraid Rip Red and maybe Solovet already suspect that he's a rager. Gregor tells Twitch Tip he's going back to sleep, but he finds himself biting his lip so he doesn't cry, knowing that if he gets back from his quest alive, he'll have to talk to Rip Red. He's just like so scared of what this means for him, and he's so scared of what he is. It's really heartbreaking. It's so sad. It's like when he found out he was supposed to be the warrior all over again, because I think it's still something like that he's still in denial about like he doesn't see himself as that warrior figure but this kind of confirms him as that figure and that must just feel so horrible when he's been running from it this whole time yeah yeah because this whole time he's kind of been like well he's like getting more into the belief of like sandwiches prophecies are real by now but especially in the first book he was like this warrior stuff isn't real they just think i'm the warrior i'm really not and then he finds this out about himself that being a rager is just super rare and he is one and that kind of just confirms like oh wait i'm kind of the chosen in one and that sucks right i wonder when the concept of a rager came about in the underland and like if that was affiliated with sandwich at all because like it seems to make sense that it would describe like both gregor and rip red like it seems like a very specific trait that people have so it makes sense that they would label it but also what if it's just as bullshit as the prophecies are wow you're right i had not considered that yeah because twitch tip says the rats have a name for what you are and that kind of implies that the rats have been recognizing this skill or this skin in people but yeah yeah we don't learn about it from humans so interesting i also just like that he's like talk he's thinking about how he needs to talk to rip red if he makes it back alive and i just love that even though he doesn't really like rip red and doesn't really trust him he's just so desperate to figure out this rager thing that he would go to rip red for help yeah i mean like who else could he go to about it other than a therapist which he should also do but that's unrelated <laughs> <laughs> hours pass and everyone wakes up Gregor has lost track of how long he's been in the Underland, and that makes him think about his family waiting for him back home. He wonders if it's almost Christmas and thinks about how everything is worse around the holidays because everyone else in the world seems to be in a happy mood. Everyone on the boat is going a little stir-crazy because of the tight space and because a lot of the food was lost in the whirlpool. The Fireflies complain about Luxa and Aurora getting fed because they weren't even supposed to be on the trip in the first place. Gregor and Temp both end up giving Boots half their rations, but when Boots is still hungry, Twitch Tip offers some of hers as well. Everyone is shocked by this, and Twitch Tip says it's just because it reeks of humans and she can't stomach it anyway. But Gregor thinks about how this might be a first, a rat giving a human her food. Love this moment. Love it so much. It's such a small moment, but also it's just so important to like the overall themes and narrative of the series. Absolutely. At this point, Gregor has saved Twitch Tip's life. And I think Twitch Tip is like totally ready to just like ride or die with Gregor. That means like feeding his little sister. And Twitch Tip is just like, yeah, sure. Like she can have some of my food. But this is like such a big moment for everyone because no one has ever seen this before. No rat has ever been given the opportunity to choose to give their food to a human child. Yeah. 
it really sets up what's to come in Curse of the Warbloods when like the humans and rats and all the species are forced to work together in like such a way that they've never had to before. And I feel like this small moment is just, I don't know, the beginning of that relationship. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Howard isn't worried about starving because they can catch fish, but unfortunately there's no way to cook it. Gregor briefly considers trying to warm up his raw fish on Photos Gloglo's butt, but then he remembers that people eat sushi all the time in the in the overland, and although he's never had it, his friend Larry said it was okay with soy sauce. So Gregor just pretends he's in a fancy restaurant. Love that. I love the moments when you're just like, oh yeah, this is an 11 year old boy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Also, just the idea of like him briefly considering Photos Gloglo as a source of heat. <laughs> yeah, I think it would have been deserved. I think Photos Gloglo deserves that level of, of loss of dignity. Yes, <laughs> he would never allow it. But yeah, he would deserve it. Luxa doesn't seem to be enjoying the fish either, but since she was never supposed to be here, she can't complain. And she wants to be able to eat anything Howard can eat anyway. Twitch Tip smells land, but the map doesn't show anything. She explains that it's an island that smells like fresh lava, so it must be recently formed. There's insect life on the island, but Twitch Tip doesn't know the name for them. Gregor puts boots in a life jacket because the last thing Twitch Tip didn't have a name for was the whirlpool. Gregor has a bad feeling about an island full of unknown insects, but as they get closer, the bats start to get excited. They can hear that they're tiny insects, but there are millions of them. Pandora compares them to some mites she's encountered before that were harmless and tasted as good as something called blue bits, which the bats seem to love. Merith is reluctant to let the bats go explore the island, but Howard says, If they are mites, what harm can they do? <laughs> Famous last words, oh no. It's, it's devastating, this next part. <laughs> yeah, it's so sad. Temp tells them that they shouldn't go and says, bug bad, but no one listens except Gregor. These people have got to stop ignoring Twitch Tip and Temp. I swear. They're very smart creatures who constantly get ignored. Yeah, I feel like Temp could have prevented at least minimum like five character deaths in this series if people just listened to what he was saying. Truly. When they finally get to the island, they see that it has a slowly bubbling volcano and jungle plants on it. The island is also humming from all the insects they can't see, which makes Gregor and Temp nervous, but Howard thinks they should check it out. Pandora, living up to her mythological namesake, cannot contain her curiosity. She does a quick flight over the island and reports back that it's safe and the bugs taste even better than bluebits. Merith says Ares can join her, and when they get back, Aurora and Andromeda can take a turn. Gregor lifts Boots up to see the volcano, thinking that as long as Pandora says it's safe, it should be okay. And then on its own line, the narration just says, but it wasn't. <laughs> it sure wasn't. Yeah. So the fact intense. that he, he picks up Boots so she can see, that's just so unfortunate. I know. Uh a black cloud of insects explodes from the jungle and engulfs Pandora. It says, one moment she was darting around eating mites, the next moment they were eating her. In less than 10 seconds, they had stripped the writhing bat down to the bone. Her white skeleton hung for an instant in the air, then crashed into the jungle below. The chapter ends with Boots asking, where are bats? Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. It's so visceral and visual. I yeah. can't stop. I can't stop seeing it. I know. It's just like I have this perfect image. Like this really, really got to me as a kid too, reading it. It's not even like violent because it's like these little bugs and it's not even graphic because she's just like stripped to the bone. But it's just this like image of like... The description, the specific description just gets me every time. Like the phrase, the next moment they were eating her, that has lived in my head right free for over a decade of my life. Yeah, it's there's something like 
sort of comically horrible. Like, it seems like it could come out of Looney Tunes. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's so cartoonish and like almost silly, but it's it's not in this instance. It's just real. And then there's no coming back after that. Like you would in a cartoon. And literally, like the fact that the skeleton hangs in the air before falling. Yeah. Oh my God. God, it's so, it's so horrifying. Yeah, this is definitely one of those scenes that just, like, sticks with you from the series. There's a handful of scenes throughout the series that are just, like, so iconic in my mind, and this is definitely one of them, because it's one of the most intense scenes in the book. Yeah, for sure. I was so excited when I was able to talk for this episode about these chapters, because it's so much... Yeah, truly. And it happens so fast. And then like, we just have to deal with the fallout in the next chapter. I think Suzanne Collins has a real gift for like taking the most minor of characters and giving them the most excruciatingly painful and like memorable death ever. Yeah, you're right. It's just, I also think of Tick from the first book. It's not like super graphic or anything, but it's just such a memorable moment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, let's get into chapter 16. So this chapter starts with Howard screaming Pandora's name. Merith has to stop him from diving over the side of the boat by punching him in the face to knock him unconscious, which gets me every time. Yeah. Oh, my God. Just like, yes, it's comical that Merith has to knock him out, but also it's just like devastating that Howard is so distraught that he is like not able to think clearly at all. And Merith just instinctively knows that he's going to try and go over the side of the boat and he just has to like punch him. Yeah, it makes you wonder if Merith had, had to do with that exact thing in the past. It's like a little bit funny, but it's really not it's just so sad. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Ares, who was flying towards the island, turns around and flies as fast as he can away from the mites, but they follow him out over the water. Gregor watches helplessly until he realizes what Ares should do. He yells at him to dive into the water, and Ares does so. Gregor is worried that the bugs will keep attacking him when he comes up for air, but then fish start to jump out of the water to eat the mites. Aurora and Andromeda grab the rope loops on the front of the boat and start to drag it away from the island. Ares catches up and together they carry the boat for several miles before landing to rest. Oh my gosh, just the suspense of like, you're right there with Gregor just watching helplessly as Ares is trying to outfly these bugs. Yeah, it really makes you notice how useless the humans are to the bats so much of the time. I want to scream like, Gregor, go help him. But also there's no way for him to really help other than what he did. And it's just so, it makes you feel helpless as the reader. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. Like there's nothing that he can do. And you're right about like the humans are pretty helpless without the bats. It makes hard. I wonder why the bats allied themselves so closely to the humans in the first place. Because for the humans, it makes sense. But I'm uncertain what the bats gain from the humans the majority of the time. Yeah, I feel like I was thinking about this at some point, too. It might be that, like, humans just have knowledge and opposable thumbs, maybe? Yeah, but then you would think everyone wants to ally themselves with them, but I guess they kind of asserted themselves in this, like, violent force. Yeah, true. Yeah, I guess maybe the bats were just, like, more willing to overlook Sandwich's atrocities. Yeah, but that is interesting. Like, I always thought that the bonding ritual is a little one sided in some ways because the humans, like, can't see in the dark and can't fly, and the bats are like their vehicles. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a very symbiotic relationship. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess humans can, like, hold swords for fighting. That's true. That is true. Yeah. Yeah, interesting thoughts. Ares has to dive into the water again to get the last of the mites off him, but he tells Gregor he's fine. Gregor and Luxa towel Ares off and pick through his fur to apply medicine to his bug bites. Ares and Luxa congratulate Gregor on his plan to have the fish eat the mites, and he admits he hadn't thought of that part, but he's glad they were there. 
The three remaining bats snuggle up together and go to sleep, and Gregor is glad that Andromeda isn't shunning Ares anymore. Luxa and Gregor make a bed for Howard and hold cold cloths to his swollen jaw. Gregor asks if they should wake him up, and Luxa shakes her head, saying, he has the rest of his life to mourn her, which is bleak. Yeah, that line, I have like highlighted notes in front of me and I highlighted that in a different color because it just got me. It's such a such a sad and depressing line. Yeah, and it's like, it's so real because Luxa knows about grief. Like she's lost her parents and she's lost Henry. So she knows what Howard is about to go through. And she's just like, no, let him be unconscious. Like he doesn't need to wake up yet. That's just like, it gets me every time. Yeah. Everyone is quiet except Temp and Boots who play little games together. Eventually, Luxa can't stand it anymore and asks Gregor to tell her about the Overland. He tells her about the last day he had on the surface, about helping Mrs. Cormacy, bringing Lizzie the puzzle book, and taking Boots sledding, but he leaves out the bad stuff, like their lack of food at home and his dad being sick. Luxa asks a few questions, but mostly just listens, and when he finishes, she says, I wish I could see the snow. Gregor tells her that she should visit the Overland sometime, and that they could dress her up so no one could see her translucent skin and violet eyes. He tells her enthusiastically, We could go out when it's kind of dark, so the sun won't blind you. I mean, even if we just went down the block and got a slice of pizza, that'd be like nothing you've ever seen. This is so cute. When is Lipsa going to come to New York City and get a slice of pizza is what I want to know. Oh my gosh, I just, I want it to happen so bad and I will never forgive Suzanne Collins for not letting Luxa get her slice of Overland pizza in the series. Pizza would change her life. <laughs> Truly. I also just love that Gregor is like thinking through the logistics of actually bringing Luxa up. Like he's like, oh, well, the sun is going to blind her so we should go out when it's dark. <laughs> yeah. It's so cute, and she's so, like, considerate about things like that all of the time. When he was telling her about his day and he left out all of the bad stuff, it's very sweet, but it's also really upsetting in its own way, because that's the same thing he does with his parents, where, like, he tries to leave out all of the bad things so that they won't be too worried. And it's like, who is he sharing the bad stuff with? Like, oh my god, you're he's all right. He just keeps it all to himself, and it's so not good, you're 11. God, I hadn't considered that. You're so right. He's like doing the same thing, but like in the opposite direction. <laughs> Luxa pushes out her crown, which always indicates she's thinking about her royal duties and says the council would never allow her to visit the Overland. Gregor tells her, oh yeah, and that's the kind of thing that would stop you. Ah, it's so adorable. It's so cute. He's so right that, like, the council would never stop her. But also, I think, like, the day she turns 16 or whatever, she should just hightail it up to the overlight immediately to see Gregor. Oh, my gosh. 16th birthday present. Sweet 16 and party in the overland. That's going to be the craziest sweet 16. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. I, I would read that fan fiction. Yeah. And Gregor has his sweet 16 and the other one. Yes. Oh my gosh. Have a big party like Hazard's birthday in the fourth book. Oh, yeah. Hopefully with, with less tragedy. Yes, hopefully. We can hope. Howard wakes up and immediately asks for Pandora. He looks at the three bats huddled together, then looks upward as if expecting to find her flying overhead. Merith tells Howard there was nothing any of them could do, and he begins to cry. Boots comes over and pats him, saying... Okay, you okay, you okay, baby. Which is what her family says to her when she's upset. Oh my gosh. It's so cute. It's so cute and so sad. And like, she's looking to Gregor, wanting him to help, and he just like doesn't know what to do. But Boots is thinking, well, obviously, Gregor can help him. Like, he's crying. Like, Gregor, come on. Yeah. Oh man. It's so sad. Yeah, but I do love how 
Boots is like also showing her emotional intelligence as a two year old, just like thinking, well, he's crying and this is what my family says to me when I'm upset. So now I'm going to say it to him. Yeah. The emotional intelligence in this family is truly something else. Yeah. Yeah. Gregor's parents did a really great job on them. They really did. Luxa sits down next to Howard and hugs him. She says, she will fly with you always. You know this. She will fly with you always. And the chapter ends by saying, it was a long time before either of them stopped crying. Devastating. Oh, I'm sad. Luxa comforting Howard is just so special though it's just so sweet it is because like up until now she's totally just been like oh my my found cousins yeah at this point she's she's seen the amount of grief that he's going through and like she's totally been where he is and she just knows that he needs to hear this that she will fly with him always like that is exactly what he needs to hear yeah i feel like maybe luxa is uniquely qualified to to say that to him because she's probably had like the most loved ones die out of anyone here like yeah i think she would have come around to howard sooner or later regardless but i really think that pandora's death like they would not be as close as they end up being without this happening which is like really sad and bittersweet in a way but Mm -hmm. it's it's like the same way that the bats all huddle together and they all have each other like something good still comes out of it and they get a little closer yeah i agree it's like this terrible thing has happened but it just like forces them together more because they need to look out for each other like how and the other bats are finally like huddling up next to aries and stuff yeah narratively speaking it makes a lot of sense like why pandora was killed off it's just so upsetting and it also, it makes me think of when, like, Gregor and Luke, so we're still warming up to each other. And then Gregor found out the thing about how she hasn't cried since her parents died. And it just, like, put her in a whole new perspective to know. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that, too, because, like, Luke's a cries with Howard here. And she's just come such a long way since the first book. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Oh, that's so, yeah. Yeah, she's, like, allowing herself to feel and, like, she's feeling with Howard and that's, like, helping him and, oh, there's just so much going on. Yeah, the these books really excel at bittersweetness because it's so often that, like, the grief and the loss are, like, facilitating love and friendship. And it's like, well, why can't we just have the love and friendship? But... I guess it it just doesn't work that way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work that way with Suzanne Collins. (laughs) No, not at all. Yeah, I did want to read a little bit of this this post by Tumblr user C. Warren Mess. They said, I think part of what makes character death in Gregor the Overlander so painful is the way other characters react to it. I've been thinking about Pandora's death and how much even that hurt. We didn't know Pandora very much, And all we knew was that she was bonded to Howard, someone Luxa disliked, and that she refused to sleep beside Ares. So when she died, there wasn't much to mourn in terms of character. However, the reaction from Howard was devastating. It was so painful. And from a character we barely knew and had reasons to dislike, it's incredible writing to cause that effect. And I just, like, couldn't agree more. Yeah, definitely, yeah. It's like going back to Tick, like we really didn't know much about Tick at all, but like Gregor is just so devastated because like Tick was so nice to his sister and to him. Yeah, truly. Yeah, it's just like we really like don't even care that much about Pandora, but we see Howard's grief and then we see Luxa kind of like empathizing with him and that that makes us empathize with him. Yeah, it's really powerful, even though we don't know Pandora and even Howard that well at this point. I feel like Suzanne Collins could kill off, like, a rock and still make us feel something about it. Oh my gosh, you're so right. Yeah, some really powerful chapters we've covered here today. Yeah, wow. There are so many also just very, like, strong individual lines in these chapters, Luke's says line at the end of she will fly with you always that also stays with me a lot. I wonder if that's like something she just said in the moment or if that's like a common saying that goes around. Oh yeah, that totally could be true. Oh man. 
Yeah, some great chapters. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Audie. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a good time. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. Um, is there anything that you want to promo at the end here? Oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, I am Prophecy of Grey on Tumblr, if you'd like to see my occasional Underlight Chronicles posts. <laughs> They're very sporadic, but they do happen. Yeah, yeah, and check out Audie's cool tattoo. Yes, it's my pinned post. <laughs> Just a reminder to everyone that I'm taking a little mid-season break this month. The next episode of the podcast covering chapters 17 and 18 will be airing November 27th. Don't forget to follow us on Tumblr, Instagram, and YouTube at Return to Regalia to never miss an update. Thank you for listening, and until next time, fly you high. <laughs> <laughs>